Hello, everybody. It's very nice, very nice to see you here. I can relax for a minute, having just rushed over from the indoor dig for youngsters, which I'm doing again at three o'clock, if anybody's interested. Um, right, I have a few um, housekeeping notices to start with. Um, welcome to the Festival of Ideas, uh, an absolutely brilliant idea. Um, this is my fourth visit here. I keep inviting myself back and people keep accepting the invitations. Um, my name is Julian Richards. I'm an archaeologist, um, an educator and Stonehenge obsessive, but I'm not talking about that today. Um, and I'm going to be chairing the event today um, on the basis that I know Phil. And uh, apparently no paleontologists were available at the time, so they're using an archaeologist instead. Um, right, well, it is a great pleasure to introduce... Phil Manning, Chair of Natural History and the Director of the Interdisciplinary Centre for Ancient Life at the University of Manchester. Um, Phil is a Fellow of the Explorers Club of New York, the Geological Society and the Royal Geographical Society. Um, you may recognise Phil from some of his TV appearances. Um, he's a, both a curator and a museum consultant, but he's researched and built exhibitions all around the world, and you've probably seen his recent uh, program on the, they describe them as the, the badlands of Wyoming, is that a correct term for them? Dinosaur country, where he tells me there's actually a dig going on this very day and images have arrived. So what Phil's going to do is to share some of the findings from this very spectacular Wyoming site where he's been working since 2016 and reveal why the site is so important. And also, I suspect, talk about the recent BBC TV programme. So it's with huge pleasure that I introduce Phil. And just to point out, Phil, I'm wearing dinosaur socks in your honour. So, <laughs> Professor Phil Manning. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That was good. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming inside on one of the most beautiful days of the year. But it is aircon in here, so you're going to get some advantage, I hope. But um, I want to tell you a story. I think we forget that when we talk about science, it often terrifies a lot of people, but it's just another wonderful story. Science is often delivered to us in a fashion that we find it a little bit inaccessible. It isn't. It's beautiful. And the wonderful thing about science, like all good stories, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But it's one that's continuously being written. And it's one which is being written by thousands of scientists around the world, but also scientists such as yourselves. Every day you get out of bed, you make decisions. You predict what's going to happen, and you plan accordingly. And even when you're baking something in the oven, I look at cooking as a scientific experiment. Because guess what? It can go wrong. <laughs> Especially like mine, my cooking can. But the wonderful thing about when things go wrong in science, we learn. One of the most important things we, things we do as scientists is make mistakes. And um, what I'm going to bring you into this strange world of was, was the slings and arrows of misfortune that chased us in the field of paleontology. It's a wonderful field. And we mustn't forget that when we look at universities and so on, that's, that's academia. For me, when I'm in the field, actually working on these objects, that's science. We mustn't mix the two up. They're two very different worlds. So let me bring you into my world, and I'm going to tell you about this wonderful place, which has inspired Julius Sistoni to make this beautiful image, which represents a snapshot in time. How do we get to that moment? How do we recreate when dinosaurs roam the Earth? It's such an abstract thing for us to think about. Just think, when was the last time you saw a dinosaur by the one you're looking at now? Maybe when you're outside, you would have spotted some floating around on the lake, quacking away, or maybe trying to take your sandwiches. The geese are very good at that here at the University of York. But those are the direct descendants of dinosaurs. We still can see just ghosts of the past in some of the life forms that are alive on the planet today. So when you next look at a bird, 
Think of it not as a bird, but as what I would call an avian theropod. Great word, theropod. Sounds like something you go to the doctor, they give you cream, and it clears up in a week. A theropod is, means literally beast foot, and it refers to all of the predatory dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs are well and truly still with us today. They've just evolved feathers. These ones, from the evidence we have so far, didn't have feathers. If you want to study Jurassic dinosaurs, you don't have to go very far. Does anyone recognize where this is? Not Kimmeridge, but that's a really good, whoever's whispered Kimmeridge there, I'm impressed. Because <laughs> that's Jurassic down on the south coast. I was only there a few weeks ago with my undergraduates. This is a little bit closer to home. Ravenscar, you're in the right succession. It's not Ravenscar, but it, this is Whitby. And you're looking up towards Salt, Saltwick Nab. And this is what, what always worries me that they call it this, is jump down bite. Don't jump there. It's very sheer. But you're looking at layers of rock that were laid down when there was a low-lying coastal floodplain on what is now the Yorkshire coast some 175 million years ago. And by reading these rocks, and geologists can do that, when you turn over a slab of rock, you are turning the pages of a book and you can read the information from that book, whether it be through the sediments, the structures you see, or the life that you find within these rocks. It can be quite precarious in Whitby. Before they put all the sea defences up, you would often get wet, because that's, that's the Whitby Harbour when you're going here. You're coming around. There was, a, there was a cut-off point, and this is one of my colleagues about to get very wet. So there are some things you've got to think about. You have to remember tides if you're going out collecting fossils on the Yorkshire coast. But in the succession that's above us, now just behind here, these are marine rocks, but on the top here, there's a boundary here. That's where the dinosaurs were, but this is where you get the sea dragons in these lower rocks. And that's what Whitby and the Yorkshire coast is very famous for. In fact, if you go to the Yorkshire Museum in York, which I thoroughly recommend if you get time in the next few days, if you're here for a little bit, you might see one of my old friends. This is, this is Romaliosaurus zetlandicus. Now, if you were swimming around in the lower Jurassic seas of Yorkshire, you might have come across this or one of the long-necked, small-headed, paddled plesiosaurs. But this is one of the pliosaurs. This is one of the big-headed, short-necked, big-teeth chomping versions. These things would have been chomping down and chowing down on any animal that was, happened to be swimming around. The, the skull of this, this animal is about yay big, but they grew much, much bigger. There's a creature from the Oxford clay, Liopleurodon, whose skull is about three and a half meters long. So they get pretty big, some of these creatures. But <clears throat> the Yorkshire coast is also famous for a very rare slice of time. Now, how can that happen? What is a slice of time? Geologists like to think of time in layers, because that's how the sedimentary record, when rocks are laid down as sediment, muds and sand over lots of periods of time, they're compacted into rock, and they do so. And imagine a layer cake. And as you cut into that layer cake, pull out a slice, you can see the layers of that cake. The lowermost layers, of course, the oldest, and the ones at the top, the icing, is the youngest. When you look at a particular layer of rock, which is from the middle Jurassic, it's an astoundingly rare moment in Earth history where you've got to go to South America, North America, China, or the Yorkshire coast, to go and see this, this particular slice of time. So it's very important that we study it. And the, the green rocks here are representing sort of the, the, the middle Jurassic rocks. And you can see these funny little footprint symbols. These are three-toed footprints. Because everywhere you see a footprint on that map, if you happen to be out on the Yorkshire coast, walking along the beach, and you look at something and go, huh, that's funny, it looks like a dinosaur footprint. It might be. So it's worth, yeah, right look, young man. I can do that. Yes, you can. So it's really important that if you're out on the coast, you keep your eyes peeled for such things. Now, these layers of rock that on the Yorkshire coast sit within this particular period of time. Now, if you're at Whitby, you're going to be looking at some of the lowermost middle Jurassic rocks. And they are astoundingly rare, as I say. So any fossil we find from there is important. Now, the whole Jurassic, you remember Jurassic Park? Well, Yorkshire has its own real Jurassic Park out on the coast. 
What's really exciting about it, many of the fossils from Jurassic Park, as I think of the Yorkshire coast, are held here at the Yorkshire Museum. And if you go in, you'll see lots of footprints of dinosaurs, but occasionally you'll find their bones. Now, bones are something when we see a skeleton of a dinosaur, we go, dinosaur, you recognize it. The first time you see a dinosaur is usually in a museum. Think about it. It's very rarely you go down to Tesco's and bump into a dinosaur, unless you meet my brother. But anyway, but the thing is, the, go to the museums and look at the bones. Why do you look at the bones? It's so that when you're out on the Yorkshire coast, walking along that beach, and you spot something, go, hmm, that's funny. That's, it. that's one of the great quotes, Isaac Asimov, isn't it? Great moments in science are rarely met with the words eureka, but usually with the phrase, hmm, that's funny. <laughs> it's true. Because if you look at something and think, actually, what is that? If you've got something locked into your mind that you've seen before in a museum, I know where I saw that before. And suddenly you make that connection. I've been doing that since I was five years old. Because I used to bother the curator in my local museum in Wells in Somerset. And I would look at all, all of the fossils, look at the labels and see where the fossils were found. Then I would get on my bike and I'd go and find these places. And that's exactly what you can still do today, which is quite exciting. So it's worth going to your local museum. But let's do a quick trip around the world and see if we can work out where we are. Right, OK, that's a Magellan penguin. Anyone, where in the world might we be, might we be to see a Magellan penguin? Any, any, any wildlife lovers here? Penguins, one of the cutest animals on the planet. And it's a dinosaur. Yes, you know? You're getting close. You're in that southern hemisphere. Of course, we're getting penguins. But we're on the southernmost tip of, of South America, near Tierra del Fuego. That's that one. So um, we're not in Tierra del Fuego anymore, but we've still got a penguin. That's a very funky one. It's called a yellow-eyed penguin. Where might you find yellow-eyed penguins? Has anyone been to the land of the long white cloud? New Zealand. Yes, it's New Zealand. So, and that's barn owls. Go to the museum gardens, and you might see them today. They're, they often have them in the museum gardens. Um, alligators. Don't play with alligators. It's, it's very sound advice. I tried. This one's called Hercules. And, um, and especially when, when something's called Hercules, killer, or bone cruncher, don't play with them. Um, and I foolishly was trying to capture this thing for a TV show. And the things they make you do for television, learn to say no. <laughs> but anyway, but, but this is, where, where do we find alligators? Sorry, where? Anyone? Alligators. Sorry? I can't. I'm deaf a little bit. Anyway, Florida. That's it, Florida. Florida, it's, a, it's southern states of the US. They're very tempted. They like to be in warm places. So, and rattlesnakes. I'm out west. These things bug me all summer. Um, this was a fun one. Cyclura lewisii, um, the blue iguana. And that's a real color. I've not been photoshopping that color. Where might you see those in the world? There's one island in the world where you'll find this species of iguana. It's the Cayman Islands. And it's a bizarre looking thing. They went down to only a few a handful of the species because dogs and cats decimated the population. But thankfully, they, they did something about it, and they did a brilliant breeding program. There's now something like a 1,000 of these individuals, so they're no longer critically endangered. So it's a really positive conservation story. Why am I showing you rhinos then and koalas? We know where we are in the world with those. Where are we in the world now? When we are traveling back in time, we have to navigate the geography of the past. This animal lived on a series of island archipelagos in what is currently southern Europe. Southern Europe at that point, the Alps didn't exist some 150 million years ago. So you have to reconstruct what the world looked like back through time to then understand the distribution of life to understand life. We have to do the same today. It's called biogeography. But when you're going into the past, you have to understand what it is in terms of the lost worlds, as it were. Biogeography is quite fun, because look at these poor penguins going, when's it going to get warmer? <laughs> well, if they stay put, it might get warmer soon. Well, millions of years. In geological time, that's a snapshot. But, but geography 
And where animals are on the planet are controlled by climate, things like oceans and mountain chains. What's the actual ground underneath you made of? Because that's going to control what grows. And then also, if an organism starts evolving in one part of the world, and it's an island, the chances are it's going to stay on that area for a long period of time. So to be quite honest, when we look into the past, it's very hard to constrain what's happening with the evolution of life. That's why we have to be very careful, especially because this is going on all the time. Yes, hold on to your seats. We are gradually drifting north, roughly, and this is a disgusting fact, about the same time at which your toenails are growing. Same time of speed as of your toenails. Horrible thought, isn't it, really? But, but this global ballet, which has gone on for hundreds of millions of years, continues to go on today. Now, if you're an organism living on this continent, having, oh, this is wonderful, I've got all this access to all of this landmass, then suddenly the landmass starts breaking up and your, your range gets smaller. Oh, it's going to get even smaller in a second and even smaller. That has huge impacts on the evolution, what happens to your group of animals. And this is what we have to bear in mind when we're looking into the past. Now, for instance, this is Yorkshire. <laughs> we'll meet this particular character in a minute. And when Europe and Asia, which were connected, broke apart from North America and South America, you got this rift, which we now call the Atlantic. And anything that's sort of stuck here is going to maybe look a little bit different. When did this happen? It's about 175 million years ago. What is the age of the rocks on the Yorkshire coast? For the Middle Jurassic, about 175 million years. Perfect time for us to study what's happening. And there we have Yorkshire there. This is the Cleveland Basin as it was slowly infilling. And you've got land here. This is all land. And this dot is when we've got marine reptiles stomping around. But on the shores of this little island, there would have been pockets of various dinosaurs going about their business. And there's probably a close enough land masses to allow some movement still between animals on this side of the pond to this side of the pond at that point. What does it mean in terms, when you look at, this is a family tree, it looks really messy, but again, look, this green line represents what is the Yorkshire coast. And it's a point when we're seeing the last vestiges of the breakup of the northern supercontinent, southern supercontinent. What does that mean? It means that the rocks of the Yorkshire coast are really important. It gives us insight to what's happening. Now, this is Alan. We didn't have enough information to give a new genus and species to Alan, but Alan was important. I was walking along the beach with a group of friends a few years ago, and I was explaining what fossil bones should look like, because people hadn't found dinosaur bones on the Yorkshire coast for over 100 years years. Because all you find are the footprints on the Yorkshire coast. Wrong place to find bones. Okay, I'm going to keep looking, because they're here somewhere. I used to go on about this. And I said to my friend Alan Gurr, who was a lovely chap, police forensic scientist, a really good scientist. And I said, well, these bones are going to be very distinctive. He says, why? He said, well, they're going to look like bones. But they're look like big bones. He said, well, what does a big bone look like when it's been weathered a bit? I said, well, it looks a bit like a crunchy bar. Because look, when you bite into a crunchy bar, you've got those little holes through it. That's a bit like what bone looks like. He said, oh, like that. <laughs> I can't say what I repeated at that point. Because <laughs> I've been looking for a long time. And this toad, no, he was lovely. He said, look, that, that, that looks like it. I said, yeah, that's another dinosaur I've not found. Anyway, but we picked it up. And it was, it was Alan. It was a vertebrae from the, um, near, near its backside. So it's on the tail of the dinosaur near its bottom. And that's really important for this group of dinosaurs, the sauropods, which are the long neck, long tailors, because bones here are very diagnostic. That allows you to identify lots of things about this animal. And it was very exciting because it had lots of strange bumps and lumps on it that made it look very, very primitive. That means it belongs at, a, at one of these crossroads in the evolution of dinosaurs. Another way of putting it is if you zoom in, oops, zoom in, there we go. Um, it, it sits here, and it was the earliest type of this group, the eusauropods, anywhere in Britain at that point. So I kind of look at those as being keystone, and I love these. In the same way, and this is not a dig at archaeologists, and it's really good, I'm so grateful that Julian introduced me for the simple reason, the amount of times I'm called an archaeologist, I'm sure you're called a paleontologist a lot as well. 
but the two things are divided. But one thing I use in, in time, archaeologists like looking at human history, usually up to about 50,000 years, sometimes a little bit over, we deal with the rest of life on Earth. Now, when an archaeologist finds a single pot shirt, they can recreate a whole civilization. <laughs> From a single bone, we can give you that. <laughs> so sometimes we have to extrapolate a little bit from what is actually very poor data. But that data still represents that it was from an organism. Whether this event has actually ever happened on the Yorkshire coast, who knows? But um, what is really important, when you open up this group, you might recognize a few very famous dinosaurs here, um, such as Brachiosaurus and our friends, the Camarasaurus and so on. Uh, over here, Diplodocus and so on, or Diplodocus, and there's various other dinosaurs which fit into this family tree. Where does, where does Alan sit? Alan sits down here, and I look at him as a sort of a keystone species. Isn't that amazing that a single bone from the Yorkshire coast can help us better understand the evolution of what becomes some of the most incredible creatures ever to have walked on the planet? But I've been spending a lot of time working on sites where these guys are being dug up as well, so I'm top and tailing my work at the moment. But just to reinforce, this is if you do go to the Yorkshire coast, and you'll, you will have a good chance of finding these. This was only a few months ago. That's a hind footprint. You can see the claw marks here. This is from a, one of those long neck, long tail dinosaurs. And this strange crescent shape is its, is its front foot. And this was just near Whitby that we found this. And what's really cool about it, when you look closely at this, what do you think these lumps are here on the side of the foot? See how it's scratched going in. What does that look like, those strange lumpy bumps? Yeah, it's skin. You're right, it's skin. So you get skin impressions on some of the footprints on the Yorkshire coast. That's pretty cool. So you can still find these out there now. And if you look up into the cliffs, high up into the cliffs, and I want you to look when I play the video along the underside of this layer here, because this is a sand unit that was pushed out what we call a crevasse play when a river breaks its banks and it pushes sand into any of the mud that was on the side of that river bank and it, it fills it in. And if you look on this underside here, these lumps hanging down, like there, there. Well, that's a bit more obvious. There, there. These are all footprints. That's a footprint. That's a footprint. But you have to, that's where a hand is squished right into the sediment. And... Let's see, any, oh, I'm getting dizzy here now. But these are all footprints on the underside of this sand layer. And now you can see where you are. You look up to those sands in the cliffs of Whitby, and you've got to have good eyesight. But please be careful. When you're out, these cliffs are really dangerous. It's a tidal platform, so please, if you're going out there, make sure it's a falling tide. And don't go directly underneath the cliffs. Um, one of my friends, Neb Hollingworth, was out there two days ago, and the cliffs were falling down around him as he was looking for fossils. So you do have to be careful when you're out there. When we're out there with our students, we make them all wear hard hats, so we've got to be careful. But this is where we are on, on, in terms of Yorkshire coast, back in the middle Jurassic. I've also been looking at material down here in South America, and it's wonderful some of the vehicles you get to drive, by the way, in the field. This, this is a converted Fiat 127, otherwise known as a death trap. Um, if you ever see a vehicle which has no guards over its wheels and you're driving in a sandy substrate, avoid, avoid, avoid. Because do you see those marks on the windshield? That's, that's all from stones hitting it at speed. So it's one of the most lethal things I've ever had to drive in. And I've seen large bones of dinosaurs this size, sauropod bones, strapped onto the roof of this particular car. It's not the safest vehicle. I much prefer the Land Rover in the background. But the one thing I was known for in um, South America, which is rather unfortunate, but I'll admit it today, I got a nickname. You always want a nickname in the field, one that you're going to be proud of. I tend not to tell people this one. Um, this object here is rather rare. It's a bunch of plant material squished up into a ball. What does it look like? Poo. poo, thank you. It's poo. It's the best thing ever, poo. It's dinosaur poo. Poo is rare in the fossil record for di dinosaurs. Plant eaters are astoundingly rare. It's like a little ball of dung. And I got the nickname of Signora Coprolipi. <laughs> Mr. Poo. Yes. Anyway, but the things we remember in the field. But this, these dinosaurs, again, from the middle Jurassic of Argentina, like our friend Paticosaurus here, are pivotal in our understanding of Alan. 
and understand the distribution of dinosaurs at this point in time. The ones in South America are still quite similar to Allen because the continents haven't drifted apart and the, the populations haven't started changing into these weird and wonderful forms we see later in the Jurassic. For that, we have to go to North America. And this is where I've been spending the last six or seven years digging at an amazing site with a wonderful museum in Indianapolis called the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. They have a fantastic dinosaur exhibit of the Lake Cretaceous. And they said, can you help us with a Jurassic one? I said, I'll be over the moon. So we've worked with them and also the Naturalist Biodiversity Centre from the Netherlands, and we've had colleagues as well coming out from the Naturalist Museum in London and our team from the University of Manchester. So a big international team comes out because there are bones everywhere. If you're a budding paleontologist and you want to go and find dinosaurs, I could blindfold, blindfold any one of you and you would find bones at this site. It's an embarrassment of riches. These limb bones and these are line of vertebra, they're actually still in situ. And I know I'm short, but those bones are big. And we've been digging there for creatures such as these, the sauropod dinosaurs, for, the, uh, say, the last seven years. And this is where we are. Now, this is in Wyoming. And this is the boundary between, that's Montana up here, and we're into just Wyoming here. The site sits on the boundary between Montana and Wyoming. Um, we're literally in the beautiful middle of nowhere. And it's, uh, this hasn't been photoshopped. This is the color of the sediments. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. By the way, one of the things I really want us to do, generally, in the world of natural history, paleontology, and science, is fall back in love with the planet. We need to love this planet a little bit more. We tend not to hurt things that we love. But... If there's something to fall in love with, it's this scene. It's absolutely beautiful. These are the prime mountains in the background. We look up to these, and we see the snow slowly melting through the field season. It gives us a measure of how hot it's getting. I say hot, it can be cold as well. When we got the site back in 2016, um, anyone who can uh, do the conversion, this is Fahrenheit. So um, let me think. Let's do a quick conversion. Minus 4 is minus 20 Celsius. So the other numbers become almost immaterial at this point. It's absolutely freezing. We got the lease for the site, and a team of us from the Children's Museum and Manchester went along to make sure all of the bones were put to bed for winter. You don't want them exposed at the surface because they'll get frost, freeze-thawed, and shattered and broken. So we're used to working in quite extreme conditions. Um, this is where the site was relative to um, oceans at this time. So it was relatively centre of what is now the USA. But there was this tongue of sea coming in to the north, the Sundance Seaway. So just below the rocks where we get the dinosaur bones, we are getting marine reptiles as well. So it's a phenomenal site for us. And let's just remind ourselves, that's Yorkshire over here. Now, this is one of the typical scenes. When you think of Jurassic... It's funny, you say Jurassic Park. The first dinosaur you're all thinking of is T-Rex. You are closer to T-Rex in time than T-Rex was to these dinosaurs. Such are the depths of time when you're dealing with geological time. Think about that. That's a huge time difference. These dinosaurs are horrible to excavate. I have learned now that lap-sized dinosaurs or ones that you can cuddle are the ones I want to work on. When the bones are as big as you, it has all sorts of logistical issues of how to get over that in the field. And if you look at this, this is where the dig site began. We've got the initial quarry where you would have seen me crouched earlier with the bones all around us. And, oh yes, I should introduce some of the health and safety things. <laughs> now, I have tracked a grizzly on the site once, that's once too many. We're near the Prime Mountains where grizzlies are quite well known. Um, rattlesnakes are not uncommon. Scorpions, they're not meant to be around in Wyoming at this um, latitude. They are. And they're horrible when they crawl down your neck, that's all I can say. And the black widow spiders and so on. The bunnies are lovely, but if there's bunnies around, there's things that want to eat them. So you've always got to be aware of this. And I always love this. They're very, very kind in North America. They give you stickers as to what not to do with your, with your equipment in the field. And I, I have no idea what these people are doing. But anyway, <laughs> but 
there's some very strange directors you get. But we do use quite heavy equipment. And it surprises a lot of people. When you have this image of archaeology, you've got people working with delicate instruments, gently brushing away the sediments. When we're removing a channel sand that sits on top of a lake bed, which is full of dinosaur bones, we have to use large earth movers to remove the channel sand that has almost no bones in it at all before we get to a nice, quiet lake bed, which is the just-so place to find dinosaur bones. So we do use some quite heavy equipment. We also use a motley crew of people. And there's, actually, there's Paul Barrett from the Natural History Museum, and there's folks from the Children's Museum here, and one, even one of my ex-students who went feral. He decided he, he didn't want to go back to college and stayed out digging dinosaurs. I'm very jealous of him, because he's there today, and I'm not. <laughs> but anyway, they are literally digging bones out from this site today. Um, as the quarries develop, you start doing what archaeologists do. You do a plan excavation. You carefully clean off the surface you're interested in and, and grid it off and slowly bring the level down looking for bones. It's just as you would with an archaeological excavation. We even use technology which archaeologists do as well, which is the, the, this is called a light detection and range machine. It's a big, I think it was a 3D laser copier. And all it does, it creates a 3D landscape that you can then interrogate later. So this is the landscape. And so we can go back to our dig. This is where the dinosaur bones are all laying. And it helps us work out which bone is where relative to each other later. So we can record in three dimensions every single little bit about that site. And you also pick up other interesting things, including your dig team. You can print your dig team if you want to reproduce them. Um, and they're looking rather sorrowful there because they're moving. But in here, we started finding something that was a bit strange. And it was very hard to see when just looking. But there was these little dots all over this layer underneath where the main bones are being discovered. And it looked like there were tracks. So when we laser scanned them, in normal color, they look, you can kind of see where they are. But when you false color them, you can start working out footprints and what animals were doing in and around what was a water hole some 150 million years ago, which is pretty cool. So this technology can help us a lot. But sometimes it's fairly obvious, the footprints. And it's very rare you see tracks like this in the Jurassic. What was really fascinating about this site, do you remember we used to get those little ball bearing games where you have little holes and you've got to get the ball bearings into the holes and it's impossible to do? This was happening on a dinosaurian scale 150 million years ago. And as the muds were washed in, which is an upper layer, across the surface which these animals have been walking, the bones of animals on that surface were being pushed and they would fall into the tracks. Very often when we found a concentration of bone, it correlated with a footprint being underneath it. So they were acting as little bone traps across this landscape as, as the, as the next, next season occurred. Now we're looking at those seasonal flooding and seasonal ponds which would grow and shrink each year. And we see evidence of this in the sediments of this, this particular site. This is the scale of the, of, the, of the lower sauropod dig. And you can see when you put people in, it's a vast, this is an old pond. And this pond is one of the sites we're digging. But at the top of the site, let's fly up there, um, we'll have a look at what is a very different environment. This was a channel sand. So imagine this big meandering river. And on the inside bend of the river, you'll see that nice sand bank. And that's what we're excavating at the top here for another group of dinosaurs. So the whole site, though, is absolutely covered in bone. We even got a dinosaur here. We nicknamed it Rody because it was in the road. We're not very original. Um, but, but there's so much bone, it's an embarrassment of riches. This here, just for scale, is approximately two meters, no, just over two meters long. Listen to me. And that's a shoulder blade. Reach over, feel your shoulder blade, your scapula. If it's two meters long, go and see a doctor. Um, it, these are huge animals, and they have their problems to, to excavate. For instance, this is a little bone that we're digging up, and this bone ended up weighing more than me. That's a single femur. And it can take you two or three days to hammer and chisel around it. It's exhausting work. It's why my back is so broken. <laughs> As I say to my students, I used to be six foot four. Look at me. It's terrible. Um, again, on the lower sauropod site, I prefer working down there because this is a mudstone. Much softer. Do you see the vertebrae here? There's a tail just beginning to appear here that one of my colleagues is digging out. This animal has literally gone <laughs> laid down in this pond area, died. And it's beautifully preserved. The bones are almost three-dimensional. 
And at that point in 2019, we had that much. We're up to about 90% complete on this skeleton now. And you'll see it on display in a second. It's the best thing about this. You get to see the end product. Occasionally, you find what articulated bones look like. So this is the, um, if I'm looking at the, that's your, your fibula here, this bone. And that's the long bone of the foot, which we walk on. And that's the toes going down here. That's part of the pelvis here, but the, the head of the femur, the, rather the, the, the femur which, where it connects to the tibia and fibula is here, so that's the upper bone. It was an articulated dinosaur, and it belongs to one of these, an Allosaurus. So the site is not only bringing us the plant eaters, the sauropod dinosaurs, we're getting the meat eaters that would have eaten the plant eaters. How do we know that? Just look at the bones of the plant eaters, and we find gnaw marks where they've been literally butchering Actually, when I lived in York, I was a member of the Butcher's Guild. And every now and then, we'd do a thing called the Mystery Plays. <laughs> and it was quite fun. But um, I didn't, I, when I learned about butchery, it was really here in the field. Because when we look at the bones of these creatures, we can see how the predators would take apart these, these other animals. So this, this is what the dig site looks like for this other dinosaur on the top site. This is an, an apatosaurid type dinosaur. I always love their vertebrae. If you like Star Wars, it looks like X-wing fighters, the vertebrae on these things. But again, so we've got two of these animals digging out. So there's our lower quarry. There's the upper quarry. As you're going up through the quarry, you get younger. It's the best thing about this site. Every day, I don't mind going uphill because I feel I'm getting younger. There's only way I'm going to get younger. But as you're going through, oh, sorry, if you're going Going through, there's the lower quarry, there's the upper quarry. You're going through layer upon layer. You're traveling through different environments, through time and space. It's wonderful. But the best thing is, when you work with someone like the BBC, they can bring this world back to life for you. First thing, these are monkey puzzle trees. There's lots of fossils of those we find within this site. But as we fly over the monkey puzzle trees, we'll come across a pond. This is the lower sauropod quarry. In it, as the... Pond dried out, animals that were coming here during the dry season ran out of water, and potentially predators took out weaker individuals. We know predators took out some of these individuals and killed them because we have the bite marks across the bones. They're remarkable fossils. And as the rainy season came along and waters washed into this, muds covered over the carcasses of these different animals. They were preserved in this perfect environment, these very fine-grained mudstones. And then we come along a few years later to move these things. Now, here's the thing. You have to be quite good with diggers. If you're anything like me as a five-year-old, I loved diggers. I still do. Diggers saved me breaking my back. Especially when you're... This field jacket here, this is a plaster jacket. We cover the bones in first in very fine paper. Then we push um, aluminium foil, if you're in America, aluminum, into the every little crack, then you cover it in plaster and burlap. And that allows you to protect the bones. Because just like when you break a bone, you don't want it to move, you put a plaster jacket on your bone. We have to do the same with our dinosaur, but it's not going to heal. That has to go back to the lab, and they'll repair any bones there. We're not going to resuscitate it. But the nice thing is, though, when you create these jackets, this one here weighs about four and a half tons. So you've got to really think about it when you're putting the straps on this, when you're lifting it. That's the first time that dinosaur's moved in 150 million years, and you've got a responsibility. You don't want it to break, and you don't want it to knock into any bones that are around it as well, because that could cause damage. So it's a really, really careful process of lifting our little spaceship here and putting it onto a, a, a vehicle that we can take it out and bring it to the museum. We also got to be careful, because if one of those straps snap, it can cut someone in half. So you have to be very careful when you're moving such heavy weights in the field. So the only ones who are expendable are, of course, are the professor and, um, and one of my students. No, he's no longer my student. We're not allowed to put our students in danger, and we shouldn't anyway. But as you see, no one is working in and around that area when we're lifting these things. It is really dangerous work, but it's fun. And it's usually 45 degrees C when we're working in that particular quarry. This is what the bones look like when you start cleaning them up. And this is what's so amazing about the bones from this particular quarry. They're three-dimensional. They haven't been crushed. 
Usually the bones of sauropods are horrible. They're almost paper thin. For an animal the size of a house, the bones are actually very delicate. It's an example of some of the most exquisite engineering I've ever seen. In fact, I'm working with aeronautical engineers at the moment to reverse engineer structures from bones like these so we can build smarter, newer, tougher materials for the aircraft of the 21st century, believe it or not. It's called paleobiomimetics. So we're using sauropods to help us um, build planes nowadays because they, they solve problems that we don't have to. And they have a lot of bones in their body for us to choose from when we are studying them. Pretty much the, the bones that we've recovered from our lower sauropod are enough for us to describe it. And we'll publish on that soon. And hopefully there'll be a new type of dinosaur for people to ogle at. The preparation on the bones continues. Or I should say, if you look here, this is a tail, and there's some... Well, it's hard to see on this diagram. Oh, there you go. Those parallel lines there are tooth marks on the bone. And there's, they tend to be near where the bones go together, the vertebrae. Why is that? The animal that was eating it was doing some butchering. It's really hard to pull vertebrae apart. There's a thing called an intervertebral disc. It's very strong. It's what holds our spines together. But if you pop the disc, you can separate the bones and take away a chunk of meat and eat it. And the predatory dinosaur was deliberately biting at the joint capsules. How brilliant is that? Very, very deliberate. That's behavior. It's nice to see it fossilized. And, um, but this is what they look like in the lab when you open them up, the, the field jackets. And the bones look, that's, a, that's the bottom of that bit there, is that bit there, I promise you. That bit there, you can just about see here. And it takes a huge number of hours to recover these. This is one of our shoulder blades. Well, not mine, but it's from one of the sauropods. And you slowly build up a picture, which allows you then to reconstruct the dinosaur and its mount. Sometimes the bones are too heavy, so you use cast. And it's a good idea with the sacrum, the bones going through the pelvis. They're so heavy. But ultimately, it's the best jigsaw puzzle you could ever work on. It's a 3D jigsaw puzzle. And we've built this now put it together, and if you find yourself near Indianapolis at the Children's Museum, you can see our friend from the upper sauropod quarry and the lower sauropod quarry on display in a museum. It took us four years to complete the dig to get these out of the ground and on display, which is a remarkable amount of time. The best thing about it, though, is that we used to bring kids out to the site as well. If I had done that, I would have been impossible as a child because I always wanted to dig up dinosaurs. I never got that opportunity. But opportunity makes itself sometime, and there are places in the UK where if you want to go and dig dinosaurs, you can. There are wonderful sites on the Isle of Wight, Yorkshire Coast, through Oxfordshire. There are quarries where if you get safe, legal access into that quarry, you can explore the world of the dinosaur yourself. If you want to learn more about this particular dig, please you know, explore maybe BBC iPlayer, and you can get a glimpse into the world of the sauropods. And it's not just about the dinosaurs. Look at these wonderful plants. When you reconstruct this lost world of dinosaurs, very often you have this sterile plane where you put the animals standing there going grrr at people. But actually, they lived in some of the most beautiful environments that are very rarely fully reconstructed. All of the plants you see here in this this, this painting, are a function of plants which were found as fossils within the excavation site at the Mission Jurassic site. So it allows us this glimpse to reconstruct more completely what this, this world of the dinosaurs was like some 150 million years ago. You say, why should we do this? Why, why, why bother looking at dinosaurs from all this time ago? These dinosaurs were alive at a time of great climate change. The stress that was placed on these ecosystems are mapped through what happens to life through time. By understanding what happened in the past, looking over your shoulder, that hindsight of past what's happened can teach us to what's happening today and maybe help us better predict what's happening in the future for our planet. The past is a very different place, but it's a very rich place for information to help us hopefully not make the same mistakes that some species have done in the past through none of their own making. We seem to be doing it well for ourselves. 
but I would argue, please, if you do get time, you can see this dig in more detail, and if you go onto iPlayer, you can see this program. But for me, the most important thing about this whole excavation is I get to work with some really good people, some wonderful friends in the field. So when I say to folks who want to be paleontologists, I say, go on, just go and do it, because you get to go and play, get ever so mucky and dirty as you want in the field. You can roll around in the mud, finding dinosaur bones. It's wonderful. And you've got mates with you who enjoy doing it as well. But it needs to be done if we're truly to understand this planet, fall back in love with our planet. We can do it as well as in the past, as hopefully as we can in the present. Because I think, really, the past is the key to the present that will give us, I hope, a sustainable future. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you very much, Phil. I'm, I'm always sort of jealous of paleontologists because you're digging up dinosaurs and, and it's somehow... You do Vikings! That's my ancestors. No, no, no. no, I, no I, don't, I don't think we can compete, really. I think, you know, dinosaurs... Come on, are... Vikings or dinosaurs? We should do the vote. Dinosaurs, yeah. Well, oh, come on, you've got an audience here who no, come no, to hear I... you talking no, about no, dinosaurs. No, but, but, no, it, it, it's utterly fascinating. And, I mean, I do recommend, if you haven't seen that, those two programmes. They're absolutely extraordinary. I mean, I sat and watched those. And, uh, and interestingly, that was what got me back in touch, saying, yeah. Phil, those programmes were fantastic because yeah. I... I love programmes that are educational and informative, um, ideally presented by people who know what they're talking about, which isn't always the case with television. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, enough of me. Has anybody got any questions that they'd, they'd like to ask Phil? Because we do have some time for questions from the audience. Yes. Yes. There's a, there's a roving mic, actually, so if oh. you could ask your question oh. so that the audience can hear. Dinosaur. I mean, which museum do they end up in? What, what museum do the bones end up in? That's a very good question. What we usually do with any site such as that is you, you work out a group of people who are going to help with the excavations. In this case, there was at least four different major dig partners. And then, because the Children's Museum came in initially with the funding to get the lease on the site, and, but all the other partners were paying their own way to, to get the excavations done, we then worked out a system like, OK, you get the first two dinosaurs. And, um, and so the first two dinosaurs went to the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. Now, the next team from Naturalist Biodiversity Centre in Leiden, they're looking to get some sauropod dinosaurs. So our team is again helping them. We learn th as we get through the site, we're building a picture of that site. So we gain from the science, which is wonderful, and the experience. but but another institution then gets to have... And they're, they're linked, of course, with being a partnership. We can all share information on the other dinosaurs. Ultimately, we can scan each set of dinosaurs. So you could generally print the ones that were from Indianapolis to have them alongside the ones, say, in Leiden. And likewise, you know, each partner will eventually get their, their very own dinosaur. And the key thing is that we know what's happened to that bone from the minute it's been found through its preparation mounting to the final museum display. Um, because sometimes there can be um, problems when, when you acquire a dinosaur on the open market uh, that's being sold, because sometimes they can be a lot of plastic and car body filler. Some dinosaurs have more in common with a Ford Fiesta than they do actually the dinosaur they're meant to be. So, but yeah, that's a good question. Are, are you concerned about the commercialization of this? Because I've seen recently that there have been dinosaur skeletons for sale on the open market. Is this a, is this a worry? The, the only worry for me is if a dinosaur skeleton goes for sale on the open market that it doesn't go to a museum. Because if it goes into a private collection, then we don't see it for probably decades. Will it end up in a museum in the future? Probably. But it's just frustrating for us who in the, in the now want to access it to work on it because you cannot describe something which is held... In, in a private collection because it's hard to access. Mm. It has to be in a publicly accessible museum. So ideally, these specimens go to museums. And there are some, a lot of museums in the world, in North America, the Middle East, uh, across into China, who are all acquiring dinosaurs at the moment. And there is a market there, 
and people are purchasing them. But they're often having to bid against private individuals who are looking to acquire the specimens. So as long as the specimen goes to a museum, I'm over the moon. Uh, do I want them as cost-effective as possible? Ideally, I want them free, but trust me, there's nothing free about digging them out of the ground. You pay <laughs> in other ways. But yeah, it's, it's, you've, got to think, you've got to weigh up how much it's going to cost you in teams, time, and money, and salaries to get something out of the ground as opposed to just buying one off the peg. Right. But both are available. Okay. Are there any more questions in the audience? Yes. Let, sorry, you've got the microphone. Yeah. lady in the front. Oh. Hi. I was just wondering, is there a particular reason why there's so many dinosaur bones in that area that you're digging in? Like, was there a disaster or something, or is it just because it's untouched? Or That's a really good question. How do you get all of these bones in one place, so much, so rich in one locality? We did a, a road trip in 2015 around all major Jurassic localities whose leases were coming up that we would be able to get access to. And every single locality had its own feel with regards to if there was going to be more bones or just there'd be just maybe half a dozen bones from a skeleton. And out of all of the sites we visited, we went to the, what we now nicknamed the Jurassic Mile. This site just had so much bone exposed at the edges of the outcrops. And when we looked at the type of rock it was, we thought, this is a, this is a pond or a lake deposit. That means there's no current. That's a good place to look, because that means the bones have not been washed away or redistributed. So you literally find a tailbone, and it connects to another tailbone. You know the song, and I'll start singing. But, but it's, it, you, the, the skeleton is basically um, semi-articulated to articulated. So that made that site a good one. And when we found at least two or three individuals poking out, well, that was the, the first sign to us to dig there. Why they're there, it's down to that depositional environment, that type of environment was a place where dinosaurs liked going. If you think of, if you go to the, uh, North Africa today and you want to, when they take you on safari, I've never been on safari, I want to go, but when they take you on safari, apparently, you, they, the, one of the places they take you is watering holes. Because watering holes where all animals come together because they need water. And we found a watering hole from the Jurassic, basically. And where you've got a lot of life around it. If you go to a watering hole in Africa today, I've read papers about it, I'd like to go, just saying. Um, you, the footprints of predators tend to go around the watering hole, whereas the plant eaters tend to go to and from the water hole because they've got good peripheral vision where the predators are just waiting for their opportunity to run in and grab something. When we look at the footprints for our water hole, we've got footprints going around the water hole and some going to and from it. So we're working out the geography of our ancient water hole. So it's the, basically, to use good old Rudyard Kipling, just so stories, it's that just-so environment to preserve lots of animals. Um, terrible for them, but wonderful for us. Thank you. Have you got the, got the microphone? There's a lady. And then I'll go for the gentleman there and the lady okay. there, and I'll Hi. work oh, over to there. I just wanted to know what's the most unusual thing you've found on a dig. I mean, obviously, everything's quite unusual. You're digging up dinosaurs, but is there something like you've just gone? Oh! Well, it's funny... It, Every single bone we found on the dig, and in all honesty, any paleontologist who works in the field, you start digging out a bone and it starts getting bigger, 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 bigger. When some of these bones are, as I said, over two meters long, half a meter wide, they're giant. And so you keep saying, what is it? Well, I think it's one of these. They've got this ridge. It's, it's definitely one of these. It gets bigger. No, it's not one of those. So you keep, and it keeps changing. So what, what's your bone become today? You know, you go, well, yeah, I think it's one of these. And eventually, suddenly, this three-dimensional structure appears in your head, and it locks in and goes, I know what it is. And you get to do the bone dance, and everyone's happy. And, but then, because that's important, because it, it helps you relate to where you are in the overall geography of an animal. And it says, well, that means the skull is that way. You never use the S word when you're on site, because you never find it otherwise. So it's... it's it, for me, every single bone that we dig out of the ground is exciting because each one tells a story and um, each one is important as the next, whether it be a fragment of bone to a tip of a tooth to a whole sauropod femur. They're all important. All right. Thank you. Was there a gentleman somewhere that wanted to ask a question? who would had a hand up. Oh, there's a yes. boy in the middle row. <laughs> Going to pass the... What's the most common or least common bone you found? 
The least common bone is easy. That's always the S word. Skull bones are astoundingly delicate. And unlike us mammals, the, the bones fuse as, as adults. But as adults in dinosaurs, the bones still don't fuse. And, it's, and I've seen T-Rex skulls, which show looks like they've just exploded and there's bones all over the place. And they're all different elements of the skull because they never stick together. And so skulls, especially when you come things like sauropod dinosaurs, are paper thin. So they're, they're, they're really hard structures to find, and they often get crushed. So they're, they're probably the rarest things we find. Um, I would include with the skull material soft tissue, because occasionally things like skin impressions or the sheath on a claw, the keratin, uh, the actual fingernail, as it were, sometimes gets preserved. We've seen that on some fossils recently, and that's beautiful. And the most common, the most common things are two things, really. Teeth, because... Dinosaurs continually replace them through life, so you get lots of shed teeth. And when predators were eating, they'd often lose teeth and have new teeth growing behind it to push through. So teeth are actually quite common, especially on a site like this, because there's lots of animals taking advantage of these giant larders of, of dead dinosaur. So it's bringing in predators from miles around. The smell must have been wonderful. So teeth are quite common, but then you're looking at some of the largest bones. Large bones, like the big, big limb bones, um, tend to survive and then the vertebrae, the backbones, ribs and smaller bones, cervical ribs, the strange ribs on the neck and so on, or the ones that hang underneath the tail, the chevrons. They, and the more, the further you go down the tail, the smaller the vertebrae become, they become rarer too. Some of them are the thickness of pencils, the, the, the vertebrae from the end of the tail of sauropods, and they're very rare. But we get them at this site because it's a pond and there's nothing... The, the only thing that can disturb the skeleton is when other animals wade in and start kicking the bones around. We found footprints which have moved bones, which is pretty cool. But so it's in that kind of order. So, so I'd say teeth are probably the most common and then large bones. But bring me some soft tissue preservation and I'm very happy. It's very rare. So, yes, it's lady there. Hi, uh, really cool talk. Hi. Um, Thank you. Um, so just thinking, if you look at like, modern animals, you, know, you get a lot of species that have multiple morphs, um, but same species, or you can have very, very similar species that are different. So what are you actually looking for specifically in you know, do somewhat degraded bones yes. to actually how, recognize differences between how, species? So how can you tell you've got a new species or maybe just a growth stage, which can be problematic, because when you grow, your bones grow sometimes at different rates, and that can cause problems, because you can have a juvenile of one dinosaur, which is an adult, the bones look so different, they'll be two different species. Ideally, I'd love to take some DNA from my fossil and, and reproduce how related they are through their DNA. But unfortunately, molecular approaches are not available to me in the fossil record. No DNA has survived from the age of the dinosaurs. Sorry, Jurassic Park fans. No. Uh, <laughs> but... But there are other things we can look at, and, and I think how an animal grows often defines itself. So, for instance, if we can use new imaging techniques, uh, x-rays to look inside bones to see how the animal has grown, we can see maybe if they've got two bones which look like they're from the same species, if we scan them and they've got two completely different types of growth and structure within them, the chances are they're very different. So, but usually we're looking for the shapes of the bones. So we're dealing with what's called a morpho species as opposed to molecular species. Paleontology has got a real problem with this. And for instance, if you're in the Hell Creek formation and you find the bones of a predatory dinosaur, doesn't matter what shape it is, it's T-Rex. Because they want to find a T-Rex. Whereas if you're in a Morrison formation and you're looking for a predatory dinosaur, there's loads of different types. Torvosaurus, you've got our friend Allosaurus fragilis, Madsoni, you've got the Ornitholestes, you've got it's the Ceratosaurus, I can keep going. It's, it's really, so it's quite frustrating. And it's, so uh, science can often bring its own baggage to the identification of species. But as we use more and more quantitative techniques now, we laser scan bones, and you can then create 3D meshes, which you can then push into each other and say, OK, that is really different. You can see that this structure is only unique to this group. And that's why we got Brontosaurus back, for instance. Because Brontosaurus disappeared a while ago because it was thought to be the same as a Patasaurus. Because a Patasaurus got named first, it had priority. So Brontosaurus, a perfectly good dinosaur name, disappeared. 
But then uh, a brilliant scientist, young scientist, went out and looked at the bones, which were originally named by Marsh as Brontosaurus at the Yale Peabody Museum in, in the US. And he said, oh, actually, they are different. And he's found a few nubbins of bone, especially associated with the, the shoulder girdles. And it's distinct enough that he's resurrected Brontosaurus. Woohoo! Which I'm really happy about. Yes, exactly. Because it's so we, we can only base it though on the morphology of the bones. But it's a really fair question, and it's something that any scientist who's studying these things, if it even has the hint of being a juvenile, not fully grown, don't name it. If you haven't got enough, enough material, like Alan, give it a nickname. Don't name it, because you're just creating problems for other people down the road. But that's a really good question. You're a biologist, aren't you? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Phil. That was nice. that was wonderful. It's it's just lovely to see passion, enthusiasm. Um, you have got a pretty amazing site there, it and it's good. so lovely to see that it's with the involvement of the Children's Museum. I just think that's such a such a wonderful idea. So. Uh, no doubt you'll be back there Thank at you. some stage soon, won't you? To... I will, and, and, and I always say, when people say, hear the word children's museum, just never be, ever, take, always... I say to my undergraduates every autumn, it's your task over the next three months to learn as much as your average seven-year-old. <laughs> because the knowledge that kids have on the natural world should be cultivated and pushed and admired, and we need to maintain it through their schooling it tends to get destroyed by the time they get to the end of their schooling, and we need to change that. And you, the new GCSE in natural history is going to come to us in two years, by the way. Sorry, yes. I forgot that's the important thing. <laughs> this is huge. You know, I, in, in the next two years, the, the, the Oxford-Cambridge board is, is doing this new GCSE in natural history. And I, I think it's wonderful we can start looking at the world again, looking at the environment that sustains us, and understanding the mechanisms in Earth systems that are so critical to maintain, because we don't teach that anymore, and we need to. So this new GCSE will come online in the next 18 months to two years. I'm going to take it. I sit on the board who's helping, helping with it, but I'm still going to take that GCSE. It's one I want to have. So I, I really, any munchkins here, and I, sorry, my daughter who's in her late 20s, who I still call a munchkin, sorry. Any, any kids here, please bug your teachers about the new GCSE, GCSE in natural history. I think it's your world that you're going to take over from the mess that we've left. And I think we need to train you better in how that w world works. And I'm hoping the new GC GCSE will help us do that. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox no, now. That's a, no, no, soapboxes <laughs> are fine. I'm heartily good. Anyway, once again, thank you, Phil. Thank you for coming to the Festival of Ideas. Yes, Enjoy the rest of the events that are going on this week. And thank you, Phil, for sharing that amazing story with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.